I was 21 recently became a police officer and was also recently dumped. So my friend suggested Tinder. As a 21 year old and new cop, I have the I'm invincible and I can take on anyone mentality. I matched with a very good looking out of my league female. We chatted and eventually set up a date to meet. She said she had great open field to look at stars and hang out and we could meet up her house. So the night came, I was excited and she seemed to be excited when I picked her up. She guided me to the field and it looked nice. Open space, woods, deer, and other wildlife. In the field, I noticed really dim headlights in the distance. Then the van started driving towards us and pulled up in front of us, almost close enough to block me from going forward. I told her to stay in the car and I'll go say hi. I grabbed my flashlight I had in the car and walked up. In the front driver's side of the van, there was a decently sized man. I asked him what's going on and if he could back his car up a little bit. He was very polite, said he was the owner of the property and said he didn't mean to scare us. He told me he's been having trouble with poachers on his property and just wanted to make sure we weren't going to be shooting at anything. I assure him we only came out to look at some stars and wildlife. He was perfectly okay with that, told me to have a nice date, and drove away. After that, the girl started texting someone non-stop. Around an hour later, I saw headlights coming towards us again, this time at a really fast pace. We hopped in the car and moved it to a more defensive position. The same man came close enough to almost hit my car. She hopped out of my car at that point and ran towards the guy. I immediately knew I was screwed. I got out and gave them commands to back up and get on the ground. Neither of them complied. He then proceeded to charge me and knock me to the ground. Luckily, I was able to get him on his back and get up. I saw my date grab a metal pipe from the van. She told me they had a gun and to give them my money and truck and I wouldn't get hurt. Of course, with my I'm invincible mentality, I said no. She started to cry and saying they didn't want to hurt me. He then started to go back towards the car. At that point, I told him I was a cop, drew my concealed firearm, and lay on the ground. After a moment of shock from all of us, they complied. I was able to call 911, tell them my name and badge number. I had two at gunpoint and needed backup immediately. I gave our dispatcher the best directions I could to this field. While on the phone, they both fled. Again, stupid new cop young guy mentality, I chased them. I took off after the man who ran into the woods around the field. I chased him for maybe 30 seconds and heard three loud pops and saw muzzle flash. <laughs> my invincible mentality went right out the window. I ran like hell back towards my car and peeled hell out of there. I went back to the area I picked her up in, called dispatch again, and had officers come to that location. The first officers to pull up was my surgeon and my field training officer. Of course, they were both completely understanding and didn't give me a hard time about it at all. The most used words were dumbass and stupid rookie. I hopped in their car and went towards the field. Luckily, the van was still there. I was told to shut my mouth and only come out if they start getting shot at. They cleared the area and started looking in the van. They found meth right on the center console and searched the car. What scared me the most was when my field training officer and surgeon came back to the patrol car, let me out and told me to come look in the back of the van. Both of them were pale, looked horrified. I went to the back of the van, where there were several knives, duct tape, lighter fluid, a decent amount of rifle ammunition, handcuffs, and what looked to be dried blood. In the front seat passenger side, we found an R-15 style rifle and two more handguns. We called for immediate backup and detectives. When they investigated the blood, it turned out it wasn't blood. The plates had been stolen and the van was reported stolen. I still get slack about the whole encounter, but luckily, no one got hurt. I will never use online dating again. So to start, I'm a transgender woman. I'm single and I make my status as trans very clear on all my dating profiles, except plenty of fish because they consider that to be talking about sex and they will straight up ban you. So I state instead that I'm a huge proponent of trans rights. So if this guy messages me, he lives about an hour away. Kind of cute in a mildly creepy way, like something seems a little off about him, but people can't help how they look. So I give him a chance just like I would want. I discovered he's a smoker, but he says he's trying hard to quit and only does when he's really stressed or upset. We had a nice conversation and finally he asks for my number and without thinking about it, I give him the number but tell him I'm getting ready for my evening classes so I'll be slow to respond. A few minutes go by and I get, Hi, it's me from that dating website. Now usually I send standard quick message. Hi, it's Ali Simic. Just to be clear since my profile might be a little vague, I'm a transgender woman. I know that's not everyone's cup of tea, so if you're not interested, I completely understand. 
About 20% of the time, the guy isn't interested and gets rude and needs to be blocked, and the other 80% is split between immediate inappropriate questions and dick pics, casual acceptance, or dead silence. But like I said, I was getting ready to go to class, so I hadn't sent the message yet. A few minutes go by, and I'm about to text in my standard when I get another text. Who the hell is this guy, and why is he paying your cell phone bill? Me. Where did you even get that name? Him. Answer the question, who is he? I'm honestly stunned at this point, and I realize he must have paid one of those shitty websites that offer personal info for a fee. Well, if you must know, I'm transgender, and that used to be my name. I was about to tell you when you pulled that stunt. Please do us both a favor and lose my number. That's incredibly invasive, and I don't want to talk to you anymore. Do you still live at this place in this city? I'm coming to see you so we can talk about this in person. Me, lying, no, I moved a few months ago, and I'm getting ready to head out like I said, you need to leave me alone. Don't contact me again. Him. Since you have something to hide, I'm going to run a full background check on you. You lied to me, and I don't appreciate that. Me, I'm sending screen caps of this conversation, your plenty of fish profile, and your photos to my two best friends who work in law enforcement in your town, and my ex-boyfriend who I'm still on good terms with who works for the local sheriff's office. Don't text me again. I didn't hear anything else from him for a few weeks. I made sure my doors and windows were locked, and the aforementioned friends and ex would check up on me from time to time. Eventually, it just became one of those weird things that makes you laugh uneasily. And then one day, I thought I saw him at the local grocery store. Same dark hair, thick glasses frames, and just creepy guys staring at me, watching me as I shopped. I texted my ex about it, and as an upswing on things, my ex and I got back together in a casual sort of way, and he stayed the night a few times a month off and on. One night when I was alone though, I just kept getting this weird feeling and smelling smoke. I lived in a little apartment complex that had three separate apartments that shared walls, but no plumbing or air ducts. I don't smoke and I'm very sensitive to the smell thanks to asthma. The apartment had a wall unit AC, so I turned it off since it was apparently pulling air in from a neighbor's guest who must have been chain smoking, I thought. I had an ASL video due the next morning, so I was up all night practicing and recording the video, signing the same story over and over again until it was almost a dance rather than narration. A couple of times I had to restart the video because my cat was going nuts. Finally, around 7 a.m., I had the video finished and sent in, and was ready for bed, so I double-checked all the doors and windows were locked, set an alarm, and went to sleep. I woke up and got ready for school, was running a bit late, and had to hurry out the door, but I noticed something weird, but didn't have time to stop and register it. Classes went smoothly, I got an A on my ASL video, and I stopped for groceries on my way home from class. As I got home, I saw what had been bugging me. Each apartment had a small garden on each side of the porch, Mine was nothing but gravel and pavers the previous tenant had put in, but it was tidy, except for a pile of cigarette butts that looked like someone had dumped their car ashtray in my garden. There was no other trash, just that pile. Right in front of my bedroom window. I don't think anything about it at first and just get a broom and dustpan and sweep it up. As I'm doing it, my neighbor, an old man, comes out and asks if my boyfriend ever got a hold of me. I ask him what he means, he tells me there was a young man waiting for me on my front porch off and on for a few hours last night, that he'd seen the guy around before and thought he was my boyfriend. I asked what he looked like. Dark hair, thick glasses, chain smoking. I text the on again off again, ex, cops take statements and I give them the screenshots. I moved out of state a few weeks later for unrelated reasons and have legally changed my name since with closed records. I don't give guys my number anymore. Ladies and my fellow queer family use a texting app until you get to know someone because for like $5, creeps can get everything from your number. This was November 2016 in Glasgow, Scotland. I was desperate, I must admit, I'd been single and alone for some time, and it was driving me crazy. That's when I met Laura. She came across as a very sweet girl and all, but she was in a hurry to meet me. So I did. She insisted we go to the pub, no fancy dates were necessary to her, I didn't mind this. At first glance, I knew I'd been swindled. She looked different from what I'd saw before, but I didn't mind, I was just happy to have a date, I'm not exactly good looking myself. I gave her a chance. We got talking and after a few beers, things started to get more intimate. Before I go further, she was quite an overweight girl with long dark hair, and she had eyeshadows similar to Amy Winehouse, she said she was a huge fan. I'd asked about her hobbies and interests, but she asked me to talk more about myself. I told her about my job, she yawned sarcastically. Let's talk about your sex life, she said. She had slipped her foot out of her shoe and started rubbing my groin with her bare foot. I asked about hers and she said she has her kinks and that she's done things that I'd never have imagined. Wanna see what I can do? 
She said, let's go to my place. So at this point, I was starting to feel very drunk, which I was amazed at as I was only onto my fourth pint. I did have two shots though and put it down to this. We waited for a taxi. She was holding my hand excitedly, whispering into my ear that she was going to do some things to me that I'd never experienced before. In a way, I actually couldn't wait to just sleep. My head felt heavier than the rest of my body. It was like the ground was moving beneath my feet. The rest was a blur. I couldn't even remember getting into the taxi, but I do remember falling down the stairs and she was above me laughing at me. Come on, she said, get up here. I struggled up the stairs and before I knew it from what I remember, I was in her bedroom naked. It was like I'd blacked out. I tried to sit up only to find myself tied to the bed by my arms and legs. Then she entered the room dressed in bondage gear. I was deeply aroused but confused at the same time. I later delighted, don't get me wrong, but something still felt off about it all. I had dozed off for a bit, and I'd been woken up by a weird screeching sound. What you are doing, I said as she was wrapping up my legs with cling film. Hush now, she said. This is the best bit. I was no longer tied to the bed, but I felt very numb and couldn't move my arms and legs. She kept wrapping me up from my legs upwards. I was screaming at her to stop, and she had placed some cling film in my mouth to shut me up. I was struggling to breathe at this point, and I tried my best to dislodge the ball of cling film from my mouth. Eventually, I was totally wrapped from head to toe. I could barely see outside the cling film. She told me that this was my punishment for being terrible in bed, and that she has many other victims just like me all wrapped up waiting to die. She left the room that gave out some muffled screams. Then I felt myself slowly fading away. I woke up what was now the next day now able to breath. This time there were people looking at me. They had removed most of the cling film and had resuscitated me. I wasn't aware of this until they told me. It had turned out that I wasn't actually in Laura's flat but an old-fashioned hotel. The police were all over me asking me questions about what had happened. I attempted to show them her Tinder profile, but she had deleted the page. I am grateful to my rescuers that had saved me but forever traumatized by this incident and I end up with panic attacks when I see people that are similar to her. It took me a few years to finally trust people enough to go on dates, but I am still on the road to recovery mentally. I'm just glad that I'm still alive but wondering if she's still out there and if there are others like me that didn't make it.